Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we'll be checking out how to build this round table that I've got here. This is a 54 inch trestle style pedestal table. And in the video, I'll show you exactly how I made this. If you wanna make this table for yourself, check out the description where I have a list of the dimensions of all the cuts that I made. So let's get right into the action. Getting things started here is a look at the lumber that I used for the base frame. So I used seven two by sixes now in that frame. There were actually nine of those. Now I usually get a couple extra boards in case I cut them wrong. For this table I ended up only using seven of the nine so either I'm getting better at this whole woodworking thing or I just got lucky this time. Anyway so to get these boards milled up I first ran them through the planer on both surfaces a couple times and then I used my planer as a joiner to cut the edges flat on this. While not a true edge this was good enough for me. So in this shot here the board I'm using will be made into the center post so you'll see me make three cuts to get three sections and I'll have one scrap piece. Now that scrap piece is important for later so hold on to your seats before we find out what that scrap piece is for but more on that later so to make a perfectly square post we will line two of these boards up and then make a mark on the other post now where we made the mark we want to leave that line whenever we rip that out so i mark that with a check mark and then slide the fence on the table saw to that and i'll leave the line whenever i rip this so we'll make this cut twice. You can see here I rip one section of the board off, put that piece aside, and then I'll take the rest of the board and rip it again. This will give me two identical pieces that can be glued up in between the two original pieces, which will make an absolutely perfect square. Here's the four pieces that I cut to make up the post. Now, if you're interested in making this table for yourself, you can check out the description where I include the dimensions of every piece that I cut. And I'll also have a link to every tool that I used in this video in case you're interested in checking out some of them for yourself. If you're super impatient and you can't wait to get to those details before the end of the video and you missed this scene, in this shot all I'm doing is gluing the smaller pieces of the post inside of the larger pieces of the post which will make up the square. Now one thing that I do here is leave those smaller pieces a little bit higher up than the larger pieces so that I can plane this surface perfectly smooth later. So with the post set aside, it was time to make the support beams for the main frame of this table. So one two by six board will make one support. Again, I cut it into three sections, one longer section and two smaller sections. And I made four of these all together. So these will overlap to form the joint, but first we need to get these glued together. Remember the scrap board from earlier that I said would be used later in the video? So this is where that scrap board comes into use. So since all these boards are plain to the same width, they'll overlap and they'll form a perfect joint. So that scrap board is used to measure the width of in between the boards in the middle where they will overlap. I do this two boards at a time to keep everything parallel and lined up together. You could do this with four boards together at once. The scrap board I had just wasn't that long. So that scrap board is placed directly in the middle. Lines are traced on the outside of the scrap board. Then all the boards are pulled off. I put glue on the surfaces and then they'll be clamped together. And one thing that you'll notice that I did here is whenever I'm putting glue on this, you wanna get a lot of glue all over the surface, which will help give you a better glue up. Once the glue up surfaces are together, I put the scrap board back in the middle and then I squeeze the outer boards inwards to meet that scrap board in the very middle. So there should be no gap here, which you can see. That'll ensure that when this joint is glued together, it'll fit very nicely. So I cross cut the scrap board in half and then I put it in the other gap of the other leg and then I was ready to clamp everything together. Whenever I clamped these together, I used pretty much every clamp that I had in my shop. You can see here what it looked like. So the old saying that you can never have enough clamps is especially here true. Here's an up close look at the joint in the middle. So this is the important one. And then outside you can see that none of these are lined up, which is perfectly fine because we will cross cut all of those to length later. I let the glue dry until sometime the next day and then I took all of the clamps off. Now one thing that I should have done was to clean off all of the excess glue that you can see on the top surfaces because I had to clean all of that up with a chisel. I was able to do this, it just kind of took long and it was inefficient. So if I was redoing this, I would have wiped those surfaces clean. To clean off any extra glue and to level out any of the uneven surfaces, I ran these through the planer. Now I made a mistake here by planing it down just a little too much. If any actual width is taken off here, then the gaps won't line up perfectly in the middle, which did happen to me, but we're talking about maybe 1 32nd of an inch, so it was okay. And then while I had the planer out, I ran that post through from earlier. Now, because I did plane all of the sides down just a little bit, I went ahead and planed the rest of the 2x6s from earlier down, this way that they would line up whenever I cut the cross braces. Next, I cross cut the center post to length on each side. 
So one thing that I do whenever I make something like a center post is to cut it a little bit long and then you can trim the sides flush or to the length that you want. Now not only does this give me the exact length that I want, but it also ensures that I have a perfectly flat side on each end. If you tried to glue all of these up to the actual length that you wanted them, more than likely you're going to be short or long slightly. So I cross cut it this way and you can see here that I had a perfect side on both pieces of the post. So here are the four support beams after they're planed and cleaned up. So I wanted them to be 48 inches long. So I measured the difference off each side minus the gap in the middle. You could also just measure the back side keeping the center pieces together. And then I cross cut each support post to length, trimming off the excess on each end. Here I overlapped them and then I marked each piece of the top. Now I'm doing this because I plan to kind of make the ends of these a little bit fancy with the curve. So I wanted to make sure that I cut the right piece off of each one. So I measured about an inch and a half up on each leg and then look who it is, the old broken square. So if you watch my previous videos, you'll know that I broke this square a while back. However, it's still going strong. So I flipped the leg over and then I marked up about an inch and a half and I'll be able to make a diagonal where these will meet up perfectly. So I didn't actually mark the line, I just cut out a little bit to where it would go. Now I'm going to take the curve from the line to the other line. So I'm just cutting this off here so I won't have to sand as much out. This will make a whole lot more sense here in just a minute. I wanted to recess the curve a little bit to give the detail some detail. So I used the depth gauge on my miter saw to cut out a small trench on the top. I did this on both sides of the legs, obviously. And really the look that we're going for here is a complete roundover on the end of this leg. So if you used a roundover router bit, it would look similar to this. So I used my patented circle making jig, which also looks like a glue bottle, to trace over the circle. And then I just clamped this down and used my sander to match up the profile with the curve that I had drawn. Now they do make a roundover bit that's this big to put in a router. That bit is a little expensive, so I decided to do it this way. This can also be cut out with a bandsaw, but I'm not quite comfortable enough to do that with my bandsaw, so I decided to do it this way. I did have to stain the flat surface by hand, but this really didn't take long at all. So before I could glue these together, I did have to clean up one of the edges where there was some glue left over from the line. Now more than anything here, I just wanted to stress that if you are using stain, you'll need to get all of the glue out before you stain it, otherwise those glue spots will show. So here's a quick word from today's sponsor. Just kidding, there is no sponsor, so here's a quick word from me. So at this point, we've got four of these leg frames the main post and that's all the pieces that we need for the frame of this table. So basically these pieces here have a gap cut out on each side that'll make a half lap joint where they'll cross in the middle to form the joint. So real quick I'll show you what that looks like then I'll sand these pieces down and then we'll glue them up. If you actually thought that there was going to be a cut to sponsor there I definitely got you but don't feel bad because I probably would have fallen for it too. Anyway, so this is how the pieces come together and you can see here the joint that is formed when the pieces overlap. They fit perfectly in there together. Now if you've watched a lot of my previous videos, you'll see that I do something similar when making the X on a lot of the farmhouse tables that I make. So it's the same idea, just done a little bit differently. Next, I sanded down all the pieces to 220. Now nobody wants to watch sanding, and I can't say I blame you, but at least here's some evidence that I did sand the pieces down. So after they were sanded, it was time to put them together. Now one trick that I used here was to cut a couple scrap pieces the same exact length as the main post, and then I used them to gauge the spacing on the outside, which we'll see here in a second. So I put some glue down, put the post down, did the same thing up on the top, and then I'll put clamps across these here in a minute, which will hold them together. So here's the spacers that I'm using. Now one reason I do this is because if I put the clamp on one side, it'll pull that side down and throw it out of line. This would mess the squareness up, and it's very difficult to measure accurate spacing on each side. So I also glue it up above the table first and then set it down on the table because my workbench has some glue build up so everything wouldn't lay flat. With everything lined up and in the right spot, I first drill four holes from the frame into the post and then using three inch screws, I secure them together. With one side secure, you can flip the whole frame around and then do the exact same thing on the other side. Try not to bump anything when you flip it around because you obviously don't want the post and the supports to shift whenever you're moving from side A to side B. Thank <laughs> you. 
So putting the perpendicular supports on will be done in a similar process. I first just put it in the bottom to support it while I put the top on. Then I put a little bit of glue down and at this point you want to make sure everything is square. So getting it square is very important. If it is not square then the angled support braces will not line up properly which can definitely cause some frustration. Ask me how I know. Really, ask me. I've done it several times before. So trust me on this part when I say that you want it to be square. After it is square, I use 4 inch screws here to connect the support beams to the post. So the 4 inch screws are long enough to go through both support beams and actually into the post, which will keep the table very secure altogether. After the main frame supports were assembled, it was time to move on to the diagonal support braces. So I first measured exactly center of where the post was and then I used the scrap piece that I had cut off on the sides earlier to mark the angles. I have no idea what these angles are. I try not to measure the angles unless I absolutely have to, mainly because I never get them right. And I find that tracing the overlap is almost always easier. So after I had the angles cut out on the scrap piece, I used it as a template and transferred that over to the 2x6 boards that I had cut up and milled earlier. Then I just simply cut the piece off of the board. Now I did use clamps on a couple of these. Whenever you're cutting steep angles, it's a good idea to use clamp. And one thing that you can't see from the editing in this video is that whenever some of these angles are cut, I actually had to break off the back piece and then cut it again because the center bolt of my miter saw will not allow it to plunge deep enough. So I did have to make multiple cuts but it did end up working out. Next I held the pieces up onto the frame where they would go and then I made a mark and then transferred that mark to all of the other brace pieces. I then measured inward about three quarters of an inch on each one and then I countersunk holes on each of these using a half inch Forstner bit. Forstner bits work extremely well for making a clean hole with minimal tear out. After everything was cut, I put a little bit of glue on each end and then I popped these into place. Now one tip here is to not use too much glue. If you do use excess glue, it'll come out the sides and again, you'll run into the issue where the stain will not cover that glue and it'll show with the end product. So I pre-drilled into each countersunk hole and then I used screws to attach them. Here's some terrible camera work where you'll see more of my arm in the way rather than what I'm doing, but you get the idea. Another tip here is since you can't clamp these down, to instead clamp across them onto the support beam which will hold it in place. You will have to use some pressure aside from the clamp, but that definitely does help. After the screws are in place and each of the diagonal support beams is in place, I like to plug the holes that I drilled earlier using a half inch poplar dowel. So all you do is add a little bit of glue to each of the holes, then put a dowel in, tap it with a hammer, and then you can flush cut it with a pull saw. Pretty simple process, this actually works really well. And since I measured everything out prior to drilling each of these, everything looked very symmetrical. After the dowels are flush cut, you can just smooth everything over with a sander. So I wouldn't necessarily call this a mistake, but rather more along the lines of just poor planning. Whenever I cut these, I didn't leave a whole lot of space in between the top and the bottom, so it was difficult to get these dowels in. Obviously, I couldn't tap them with a hammer because there was no way to get them in there, so I just had to place them in by hand. Also, my sander wouldn't fit in. I even tried to sneak up on it, just like what you saw, so I had to sand those by hand as well. Again, no big deal, just a little inconvenient. So everything you just saw was the basic rundown of how the base was made and with the base finished it was time to get started on the table top. So I made the table top from yellow southern pine and I used four 2 by 8 by 8s which I first surface planed a couple times on each side and then I used my track saw to rip a straight edge on one side. So I don't have a joiner and this has been the method that I usually use in order to get a flat edge ready for the glue up. This works pretty well. The track saw leaves about a perfect line does take a little longer than I would like so a joiner is probably something that I'll be looking at getting in the near future but for now this works just fine. After the boards were planed and ripped on one side I then cross cut everything to length. So I cut these in half and I made four boards into eight boards. Now I kind of did some weird things as far as the measurements go. I cut an angle on one side so that I could stretch that board out and have as little waste as possible. And when I say as little waste as possible, I came within half an inch of not having enough board on one side. So if I was redoing this, I'd probably use a little bit longer boards. Regardless, I was able to get the dimensions that I wanted, so it worked out in the end. So I laid some pipe clamps down and then I put all the boards across the top and this will be the basic layout of the circular tabletop. Now obviously I'll cut these angles out which we'll get to in a minute but here's a first look at the boards making the top. 
So with everything lined up in place, I wanted to make sure that I had the full diameter of the table as long as I wanted it. So I marked the exact center and then I pivoted my tape measure on that to get the radius reaching out to the end of the table. So as I mentioned, I didn't have a whole lot of waste and I should have cut the boards a little bit longer, but it did work out with the dimensions that I wanted. So I laid all the boards up on their edge and then I put glue on one side of them. Again, it is important here to make sure that you have good glue coverage on each of the joints, which is where most of the strength from the glue up will come from. So after you have glue all over your hands, your clothes, and all over the workbench, you can then lay the boards down and get ready to actually clamp them together. I checked the radius with the tape measure one last time as I didn't want any surprises and then I began to clamp. So I have pipe clamps underneath the table and above the table. These are what will help keep pressure on the tabletop pieces as they're glued together. And then I use 2x4s over the top as cause to clamp the table flat to my workbench. So assuming the bench is flat, putting pressure downward will keep everything horizontal and it'll match the surface of my workbench, giving me both a level and a flat surface. So I left the clamps on for about 24 hours sometime until the next day, and then I unclamped everything and took all the boards off. One tip when doing a glue up is to tighten one clamp slowly at a time. That way you can sort of finesse the tabletop into the shape that you want. So after the clamps were off, I then hand plane at the bottom because I wanted it to be smooth for when I use the router to cut out the circled shape. So I'm not necessarily worried about getting a perfectly flush bottom here. I'm really just looking to get rid of any large gaps or overhangs where the boards may have not joined perfectly together. So I once again used the tape measure to find the exact center of the tabletop and then I moved it onto the table base in order to cut the circle with the router. So on the center mark that I made earlier, I'll drill a hole only about a quarter inch deep or so and then I attach the router to a board which will pivot as I go around leaving this in a perfect circle. I previously did a separate video on this in full detail, kind of explaining a little more as to how I did this. I'll leave that video link in the description. But basically, I'm just taking shallow passes using a plunge router to make a circle, and I'll plunge a little bit deeper with each pass, eventually cutting through all the way through the tabletop. A lot of people will make one or two passes, cut the rest with a jigsaw, and then use a flush trim bit to cut the excess off. That works perfectly fine, but I like to leave the router bit in and then just keep continuing to cut all the way around until you've eventually plunged through. I'm using a spiral up cut bit here, and one thing that you can't see from this full shot is that the extension cord is actually hanging from the rafters. I had a viewer suggest this idea in one of my other videos, so I gave it a shot, and it worked out great to keep the extension cord out of the way and to prevent it from getting tangled up. You can see here that I put some clamps on the sides where I was already cut through. That way that the piece wouldn't fall off and possibly tear out on the bottom side before I had the full cut all the way made. After I had the top cut out, the next step was to hand plane down the other top surface just to smooth it out. The glue up was really well, but it didn't turn out perfect, so I hand planed it. And then here you can see how much fun I had sanding the top down which I then followed by using a roundover bit on the top of the table to give it some extra detail. Trimming the edge on the top is optional obviously, but this step will really make your table look a whole lot better and really set it off to the next level. Since we're talking about some small details on the tabletop, I filled in a few of the cracks on the top with Starbond CA glue, so this is a pretty easy process follow along on my channel you'll see that I just did a video on this product all you do is put the glue down in the surface spray it with some activator and then it hardens instantly which allows you to sand it flush thereafter one final step I did before putting the finish on the table was to sand all the sharp edges down so I just sanded everything quickly with 400 grit sandpaper to knock off some of the sharp edges I just want to touch briefly on how I finished the table I don't normally use pre-stain on any of my finishes, however I did on this one since I was blending multiple stains. So I started with the pre-stain, let it set for a few minutes, then I used Provincial Stain, let it set, wiped the excess off, and then I went back over it with Rustic Beige Stain. I originally planned on just using the beige stain, but it was a little too gray for my liking. So I got creative and mixed them up. Now one thing you want to do whenever you're mixing stains is to let the second stain sit on top of the first stain. Give it a little bit of time to mix and pull that first stain back out, which will bring the highlights forward and really help the collars look better.
I let the stain dry for about three days and then I came back and clear coated it with Minwax Satin Polyurethane. So nothing too fancy or special as far as applying this finish goes. You just get a decent quality brush and brush it on. I do sand in between coats with 400 grit sandpaper just very lightly letting the weight of the sandpaper do all the work. And then after three coats of the regular polyurethane followed by sanding, this is the secret weapon to getting a good finish. So this is wipe on polyurethane. As I mentioned, you sand right before using this and then this is just very gently wiped on. I should be using a glove here as my hand is halfway made of polyurethane now, but this gives an awesome finish as far as the end look and also how smooth it is. So one thing I always try to do whenever I finish a piece of furniture, if you can, is to put levelers on the bottom. So these are adjustable furniture levelers that will help on any unlevel surface of the floor. Or if you have any piece of your table that's slightly not level, these will help out. So I have another video that covers exactly how to do this in detail very well. I'll leave a link to that in the description as well. But basically all you do is countersink these in with a Forstner bit and then drill down a little bit further, which will allow you to put a collar from the adjustable foot inside of the leg support to where you can either hide that or extend it out as you need to. So here you can see the foot and I'm unscrewing the collar, which will be sunk down within the support of the table. And these can be adjusted about an inch or so in height. So the collar is screwed down into the board using a hex key. And then the foot itself can be screwed into the support, which is actually where the adjustment comes from. There are several different sizes of these available. These are the medium size range, which fit pretty well perfectly for this table. And then these soft pads go over the piece of the foot to keep from scratching the floor up. So I put one of these on each bottom support of the table, essentially where the feet would be. And then as the table is moved into its final place, they can be adjusted up or down in order to make sure that the table sets flat and doesn't wobble one way or the other. To attach the tabletop, I use Z-clips. So to use the Z-clips, I have to first cut out a slot. So I'm using the slot cutter on my router. I like using the slot cutter because it's a quick and efficient process. Also, it allows you to do this whenever you're finished. So all you have to do is set the slot a little bit lower than where the Z-clip will go. That way, when the Z-clip is inserted, it'll help pull the tabletop down. Here's a look at the Z-clips that I'm using. So all you do is pop them into the slot that you just cut out. And Z-clips are by far my favorite way to attach a tabletop. I think they're very sturdy. I've had good results with them and they're pretty easy to use overall. After the Z-clips are inserted into the slot, the tabletop can then be put back on top, where at this point you'll want to center the tabletop before you attach it. So I just measure the distance from the top to the support beam on each side, and once I have the spacing equal, I know that the tabletop is centered. With the top in place, you can put a screw through the other side of the Z-clip into the tabletop, which will keep the top in place, but also allow for wood movement over time as the top expands and contracts. Obviously, make sure the screw isn't long enough to go through the tabletop, and with all the Z-clips in place, the tabletop is attached and the table is finished. Here's a couple shots of the table fully assembled and finished up. So as always, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it helpful, leave me a comment below. Tell me what you think of this video and the table. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, stay tuned for more.